Well, hello again, and, and thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to 2020 Vision, Construction and the New Financial Downturn. Today, we're gonna to look at real industry data from the Great Recession through today for insights into how some construction firms weathered past financial storms. We're gonna take a look at factor shaping sales and profit trends through downturns, construction industry risks to look out for, and business fundamentals for a faster recovery. I'm joined here today by Stan Halliday, our Chief Underwriting Officer and Construction Charity at Travelers, who's based in Hartford, Connecticut. Stan has underwritten major infrastructure programs and building projects across North America. And then we're also joined by David Hornbach, Chief Underwriting Officer, Bond and Specialty in Travelers West Territory. Based in Federal Way, Washington, which is between Tacoma and Seattle, Dave brings deep knowledge of the Texas and California markets. Together, they have about 50 years of construction underwriting experience. And I'm Louisa Dessen, I'll be your moderator today. I'm Director and Senior Editor in Enterprise Integrated Marketing at Travelers. We'll be talking through some points today and then taking some questions from the audience. So please gather your questions and we look forward to the conversation. Stan and Dave, thanks for joining us. Thanks, thank you, thank you, Louisa. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Today, we're going to start off the presentation with a little economic overview and then get uh, pretty specific about different elements of the construction marketplace. Really, what our presentation today is, is really about the tale of two worlds. Pre-COVID, the construction industries exhibited uh, characteristics of one of the remote, one of the remote robust markets ever in history. Our clients had record backlogs with increasing margins. Uh, we were seeing all of the subcontract trades uh, making more money than they ever had before. Uh, labor was tight in the market. The unemployment rate in the construction industry was probably at an all-time record low. Fast forward to March of 2020 and the outset of the COVID environment, and the market changed precipitously virtually overnight. Projects were delayed or stopped. Projects were canceled. Projects were modified, shut down. We saw major supply chain disruptions, labor shortages, and particularly in our subtrades, where not only project safety was a concern, but also the fact that the unemployment benefits that were a part of the uh, rescue package initially uh, and had enhanced unemployment benefits. And so we actually had clients that were complaining about the inability to get workers to the job because of uh, elevated pay levels for being on unemployment. Finally, we really expected to see a cash crunch similar to what had occurred in the downturn in the 08 and 09, the Great Recession, but that in fact did not materialize. Now, the government had done a good job of uh, priming the pump with the financial system, and so we saw projects continue to pay out as expected. We didn't see any material delays in payment or uh, owners having difficulty uh, staying viable, at least during the course of construction. So, all right, Louisa. So Stan, I mean, these are certainly some unprecedented times. As we look at the impact of business, it seems like the story is evolving almost for the worse. What are you seeing? Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to know exactly where everything's going to end up. Certainly the last couple of weeks, uh, we've seen great changes in the numbers in certain states, especially in California and, and Texas. So uh, what we thought and what uh, we're known for a little bit in the surety department is uh, we have some really good data from uh, our, our robust uh, contractor inventory that we've worked with over the years. And we've put together a couple of slides. This one is California specific, um, or, or, or will be California specific. Go back one, I've, I'm sorry, I got a little ahead of myself, uh, Louisa, but um, this one has to do with the GDP. So uh, if you can look at the last recession, the green line is non-residential construction, and the red line is GDP. And you can see when the recession hit in 2007, the red line went down a little bit and then a couple of years and then slowly slid forward, right? But in construction, uh, there's a delay, there's always a lag. And then you saw a really a seven year, pretty precipitous drop in, uh, in non-residential construction, um, primarily the, the work that you guys will do. And, and it was growing pretty steadily since then. So um, we're looking at that and thinking, okay, well, what can we take from that? What, 
can we learn from the last recession? And that's where we get to the market conditions in California. And this slide's a little complicated. So we took uh, data from a number of general contractors that are in California. And if you'll notice the, reds, the red lines are from the years 2011 to 2019, and the green lines are 2001 to 2010. So when you think about it, when you get to the end of the green line, really the red line is a continuous uh, move back. So these are for general contractors. So overall on uh, the revenue side, I'm over on that side, um, you can see that from 2001 to 2010, revenue kind of peaked in 08, 09, and then really uh, fell down to 62 million. And it started to build back up a little bit in 11. And what a great run for the industry as it moved all the way up to 220 million, a really good growth. And this is a, a number of travelers customers that have worked in the uh, California area. And that's, that's their averages. And then you go to their backlog, which as you guys know is your predictor of future work. And the backlog had a similar trajectory. You know, it, 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 it had moved up and then it kind of leveled off for a, a long period. But right there in about 2015, you see the, look at that growth curve. And it's, and it's grown from the 80, $90 million range all the way to almost 300 million in average for a middle market book of business. And, and so we're thinking about that is where are we today? Well, we're probably a, about year seven on the green line. Okay, when you think about it, we're at the beginning of this. Everyone's backlog, Dave just mentioned, is pretty good. Everyone's revenue heading into this thing was pretty good, though it was impacted by this. But the real question is, what's going to happen going forward? Where am I going to be in 2021, 2022? And we're going to try and speak to that as we move forward. Now, the next slide gets into a little more details, gets into the, your profits and your overheads. And again, remember, the green lines are the first 10 years and the red lines are the next 10 years. And so when you go from the end of the green line back to the start of the red line, that's a continuous line. And you can see the growth in profit over that same time period and then the drop. You know, look at that drop from nine to 10. And then it took about five years, five to six years to really see the earnings ramp back up. And we got back up there by uh, the end of last year, really solid year. So really good revenue growth, really good operating profit growth. And for those that aren't accounting experts, uh, we define operating profit as, uh, as revenue, less your direct costs, less your overhead. And that's your operating profit. It's what you make from construction. And if you look over at the overhead cost, you see a similar trend. So if you look at the green slide, uh, the overhead was really growing um, in the last three years before the recession. It really kind of peaked at almost 9%. And, and then, then the revenue drop, right? You see that revenue drop, and you better drop your overhead pretty quick when that's happening. And we saw it drop to seven and then get back down into the fives. And what a great job the industry has done this time at becoming more efficient and managing overhead. As you can see, overhead's not near as high heading into this particular recession that we think is happening. So, so it would appear California was pretty well positioned uh, going into this, all things considered. Yeah, heading into it, I'm sure most of your customers, if you're an agent or if you are a contractor, um, the general consensus from general contractors was, you know, I had really good record revenues and backlogs heading into this. I was making really good money and I had my overhead under control, and then bang, March hit, and it, it, it was a whole new feeling. And I think what our expectation is, most people are going to make it through 2020 okay. It's not going to be as good. Uh, jobs were impacted. Productivities were impacted. Um, but they were in such a good spot, they're probably going to make some money, and they're pretty busy. The bigger concern is, I'm not replacing work at the same level that I was before. My backlog's starting to drop. And if my backlog starts to drop, my revenue is gonna to start to drop, Louisa. 
and, mm -hmm. and that means I got to get my overheads right. I got to got to figure out how I can do. The good thing it shows, even in the last recession, as long and nasty as that was, um, most of our customers were able to make money, just not as much as they were heading into the recession. So I, I think that that's a good takeaway for that. Dave, what can we take from the, the Texas numbers here? All right, thank you, Louisa. Well, to, to continue on with Stan's comments, as you see here, uh, well, first off, Texas benefits from probably the largest single DOT budget in the United States on an ongoing basis. And that plays out here in the graphs that you see. You'll see the original two, we'll start with the revenue side. In 2001 to 2010, you saw a steady increase in the, and this is again, heavy highway. Uh, in, in, the mar or in the operating revenues of our, of our clients. Uh, beginning in 2011, you see a rather significant increase in volume. Again, reflecting the fact that the Texas Department of Transportation had significant increases in the lettings numbers each year. Backlog, parrots the same thing. You saw the backlogs had improved um, substantially during the 2001 to 2010 but yet they almost tripled on average for our clients in the state of Texas during that 2011-2019. Fast forward to uh, the next slide and you'll see, now that one of the things, these are gonna look like they're two different graphs from two different places, right? So operating profit, you'll see it in 2001 to 10, you saw a significant decrease um, in that period of 2008 to 2010 right, from the financial crisis. Yet, backlogs were still relatively stable, right? Go forward to 2011, 2019, you see the operating profits start to really take off until you get to be about 2017, 2018, and then they all of a sudden, they start to fall off. Overhead on the other side appears to be under control, so that's really not the culprit. The culprit was the fact that um, build it and they will come is what we used to say in Texas is because of the massive amount of lettings, the amount of competition in that marketplace grew substantially. Uh, and you can see that in the, uh, you would think with growing prof, growing backlogs, overhead under control, profit should be increasing, but they're not. Um, Stan's group has a presentation they do, they call it the marginless recovery. And this is where this got overcompeted. And so, you know, we, we, we call it the triangle between San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston with Austin in the epicenter. There is a lot of road work being undertaken. There are larger projects, which we see uh, in general, uh, a reduced margin on that work because of duration risk, among other things. But they had competed away a lot of the margin in that work. There's a big foreign influence, international contractors competing in that market. So that doesn't, that doesn't bear out with what you see on the previous two slides, but it is, a, it is reality in that marketplace. Okay, Louisa. So what sort of things were we seeing in the market before COVID-19? Well, before COVID, I, I think Dave covered that kind of in his intro here. Um, the biggest issue was almost being able to handle all the opportunities that were out there for a lot of our customers, Louisa. It, it was a big deal and, and things were very favorable. Upward pressure on pricing was good. That means contractors were getting more margins. There was a lot of work out there and uh, going back to simple economics, demand was exceeding supply. There was more demand for con contractors to do the work than there was uh, uh, number of contractors available to do the work. And that's a good situation to be in. Contractors love that. They typically make a lot of money in that environment. Uh, their big risk during that time was just being stretched too thin, uh, subs unable to show up, uh, getting enough labor on the job, maybe overextension. Um, uh, one of my uh, mentors used to say, contractors don't starve to death, they tend to overeat. And, uh, and you, you could see that maybe in the, in, in the falling uh, margins that you saw in uh, Texas there. Uh, but overall, it was a really good thing. Remember when all we were worried about was the U.S.-China tra uh, trade war or, you know, maybe did I get good contractual risk terms. But, you know, when March hit, everything else kind of changed. You know, we talk a lot about um, the, the shortage of skilled labor, and we can certainly see that changing uh, with COVID. 
Right. So um, this is the U.S. unemployment rate. Um, and, and you can see from 2009 to 2019, it was a great run. Um, and that all changed in a month. So that arrow up at the end and up is more. Um, if you look at the chart, uh, that's March. Um, and I know it's tweaked down a little bit in April and in May. And I don't think we have June numbers yet. But uh, it's still up in that 14, 13% range. And, and that's just a huge hit. And, and that's probably the biggest change that has happened out there. Some of that's been positive for construction, I think. Um, some people that used to be in construction that left it may be coming back because construction was deemed essential. Um, mm -hmm. And you were able to get some more workers available for that. Uh, but the flip side of that Dave hit on was like unemployment uh, with what the government has paid. Some people are preferring to sit at home and between unemployment and the $600 supplement, um, they're making more in wages than they perhaps they would are working or at least enough they don't feel like they have to work. But that, if you look back to 09, at the peak of that recession, unemployment really struggled to get over 10%. And we blew through that in a month. And, and so this is a, 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 going to be a little bit of a different animal. Yeah, so do you think that the slowdown we saw in March is, is similar to the beginnings of the Great Recession, or is this pandemic different? Um, Dave, why don't you take this one? Yeah, well, I, the, the answer to that is this, this was really like falling off a cliff. And, and you'll see it here. That what, what this graph shows, this is the AIA, uh, the American Institute of Architects Billing Index. And it's a measurement of the aggregate amount of billings the architectural community is submitting to its owners to pay for the work that they've been engaged to do. That line you see, the dotted line going across at 50%, is an index line that uh, historically uh, economists have held out. Anything above that line portends growth in the amount of future activity, i.e. number of projects, magnitude of projects moving forward. You will see a rather precipitous decline of that in, um, in uh, March and April of uh, 2020, uh, which obviously uh, pretends that the amount of work in the pipeline, getting again back to Stan's comment about the line of sight that our clients have about the future. Their backlogs today are good. Um, the margin they're going to realize on it, probably not as good because of some of the issues that they've had to face with the work underway. But what lies in the future? What line of sight do they have about future opportunities in their pipeline? That's different today. So um, the next slide here you can see is it's by different um, design contracts, inquiries, and, and overall billings. And, and the um, level of inquiry is reaching out for pursuits to engage for future work. And you can see how low those numbers have gotten. And you can see how significantly decreased the amount of billings are. And again, this pretends to the future that the amount of work that will be available in the marketplace will be down substantially. Okay, Louisa, you can go on to the next one. Stan, you want to touch on this one? Yeah, this is just regionally uh, from that. And uh, I, I think you can look at the various regions there. The Northeast has been impacted the most, at least initially. Um, those, those were areas where work was shut down heavily initially, New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania. And you can see the drop off uh, was the greatest. Uh, the Midwest and the South were comparable, um, but again, a significant drop off. And the West performed the best uh, uh, from that, but still the drop off was well over 20% in, in opportunities and, and well, well beyond anything that we saw in the last uh, recession. It was almost uh, twice as much of a drop and much quicker. And, and so I think that the thought process for everyone now is, all right, I have a good healthy backlog now, I gotta finish my work but where am I gonna be? What do I need to have in place to be successful and finish out 2020 well, but to survive 2021 and maybe 2022? What, what is that gonna look like and what do I need to be 
to be successful in that. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. So the next slide talks about um, some of the items. Uh, Louisa, can you move us forward one? I think you just there did. we go. Yeah. And Dave, why don't you talk about what folks are going through today? Well, um, can we go back to that slide just a, just a bit there, Louisa? The, that one right there. Okay, you, you see these three lines in here, and I, and I just wanted to touch on this from the standpoint of, okay, why is institutional above the other two, and, and why is commercial the lowest of them all? Well, if you think about it, commercial, for one instance, is like office buildings and retail. Uh, probably two of the segments that were hurt the most um, optically by the coronavirus. I mean, nobody's working in their offices. There's there's big conjecture as to do many companies ever go back into the office or not. And so that that has to that will definitely impact the planning around future space for office space and or retail. If if we're not going to be able to shop in stores like we have, that's going to be a whole different model. Uh, residential in in that space. Um, you know, there's there there's a big thought that there will be an out migration from the big cities, and then people will be moving back out in the suburbs. And what what does that mean for residential, i.e., condominiums and apartments that have been built in this in the center of the city? Institutional is probably the highest because it had enough work in the pipeline and is funded in part not by tax revenues entirely, but private sectors for like private universities and what have you. So that's why that number is a little bit higher. Okay, you can go to the next one now, Louisa. Mm -hmm. So the market conditions today, um, like I said, uh, Stan touched on it uh, perfectly. Uh, our contractors have great backlogs in their work, uh, backlogs, and their work has some good margin in it. Um, its ultimate realization coming out the other end will be a little bit diminished because of delays and what have you. And many of our contractors are in pro are beginning to be in, in uh, discussions with their owners about how they get paid for some of those impacts. Um, we're seeing our road contractors when, when there was nobody on the road, got a lot of road work put in place because the cars weren't there. Uh, we are also seeing a, now people have always asked us, where do you see the opportunities in the future? And I think we're gonna touch on that in the future. But one of the items here, bullet number three, manufacturing and healthcare along with infrastructure. Manufacturing from the standpoint of this whole coronavirus thing has exposed the Achilles heel of the American economy is that we were highly dependent upon sources of supply that may in fact not be conducive to um, us doing things as we need to. So I think we're gonna bring back a lot of manufacturing from China and abroad, and that's beginning to happen. Healthcare, obviously, we probably aren't if we built out enough to handle this kind of thing moving forward. And the infrastructure bill, and I think there will, we'll see something on this at some point in the not too distant future, but it's a, that's a tall order. Um, subcontractors are obviously um, better uh, available now. However, there are some trades, i.e. drywall in particular, where because of the labor concentration and as close as they work together, it's hard to get the kind of production that you need. So we're seeing some issues with that. Um, but overall, like in Stan's um, comment about the unemployment rate, with a 14% unemployment rate, there are people available to work if, in fact, they choose to. Again, mm -hmm. the inhibitor is a little bit of the unemployment benefit that sits out there right now. Uh, risks moving forward. Um, funding. If, if it's a tax-based funding mechanism, that's at risk as far as the viability and amount of, of work to be had. Uh, jobs just getting started that were already previously funded may be okay. If they were counting on future tax streams in order to pay for that, that might present a problem. Supply chain performance. I mean, we've had contractors that have been impacted greatly because they were waiting on materials from Europe and or China that were from plants that were shut down during the virus. Um, challenging contractual risk. That's one of the issues that we've, we are um, uh, exploring with our clients almost every day today. Owners are trying to put language in there to remove themselves from the responsibility loop for uh, COVID related and or pandemic or health related issues. Uh, we could see a resurgence in the, uh, in the outbreak levels and we're starting to see that now as states have started to open up. 
Worker health and safety continues to be an issue. But the biggest risk in here, biggest risk in here right now is the uh, inability or concern about the inability to acquire new backlog and at what rate. And what size will my company be in the future given the constraints that I see in front of me? Yeah, Stan and Dave, it really seems like the, the biggest risk is, is really uncertainty. And so um, contractors may be wondering, you know, given all of this and, and something that, that, you know, does really seem to be unprecedented, you know, what can they do um, to put themselves in a good position in the future? Right. Dave, you want to do this one? I'll do the next yeah. couple. Okay. So um, what this is, is... Uh, is, is something that we share with, with our clients. So in the surety business, we, uh, we strive to um, never write a bond that, or never write bonds for a contractor that fails. Well, we, we don't always do that perfectly well. But what we also wanted to do is if in fact we do have a contractor failure, we wanna learn from it to try to avoid um, the mistakes of the past so that the tuition that we spent isn't, uh, wasn't spent for nothing. So what you see here in front of you are, um, we've done an analysis of the losses that we've incurred over time and have developed some characteristics that come out of those losses. Down below in the box, you'll see difficult project plus weak internal controls equals catastrophic situation. That's true. These get at percentages of the failed contractors in our portfolio as to the critical reason behind the failure. Number one on this list, catastrophic project. One single, we're seeing way more losses today caused by one single project going bad than ever before. Problem on a large job, poor estimate, new job type or location, and bad owner. The, the next most important is obviously internal controls and system failures. And this manifests itself from the standpoint of we constantly stress with clients about the need to know where you are at all times in order to manage the business better. And in losses, we're seeing many cases where the system that they had in place did not allow management information in a timely fashion to deal with a problem before it misastatized into something that was lethal. Overextension. Stan's point about um, overeating at the buffet line is the reason for failure more than starving to death. And that is, in fact, the case. And finally, uh, excessive debt on the balance sheet. Is an, is an additional risk from an outside creditor that can cause contractors to fail if in fact they end up starting to miss their payments. So these are some four key elements of, of contractor failures. And um, in this environment today, because of the exposures that exist that aren't normal to the construction business, it's very critical to focus on these moving forward. Mm -hmm. Hey, Louisa. So what, what can contractors do um, to, to avoid that? Well, uh, this is a, a probably an interesting little graph. Some of you baseball fans may recognize uh, the little chart on the right. Um, and that's a chart that Ted Williams put together. And Ted Williams was considered probably the greatest hitter all time in baseball. But what he figured out is it depended where the pitches he swung at as to how successful of hitter he was. So he divided the, uh, the, the plate, that's home plate, into certain uh, sectors, and he, he determined what his batting average would be uh, if he hit pitches only from that sector. So you can see if he hit only low outside pitches, he would not have been a Hall of Fame hitter. He had been a pretty pedestrian player there at 240 or 230, right? But if he swung where the... Uh, the pitches were best for him uh, there in the middle of the plate. He was a 400 hitter. So we want you to think about your job and your work kind of in that regard. Uh, and this goes back to the graph before that Dave, David just talked about is, okay, what do I do? Well, we want you to do is, and, and we think about it, in, and I think about construction is really simple. Um, type of work. Well, it's really easy to think I need to keep my revenue up and try a bunch of new things. Um, and that didn't work out in the last recession. Really, uh, doing the type of work that you do is a really good predictor of whether the job's going to be successful or not. Doing it in a familiar location. Working in a new geographic area greatly increases risk. 
So if you're doing work that you normally do in a place you normally do it, um, that has a higher probability of success. Then combine that with um, the, well, the, the team, the owner, the subs, the, the designer, and the team that's actually doing the work. Are, are those all familiar partners of yours um, from that? Are you used to dealing with them? Again, the more familiar and success you've had in the past, the more likely you're probably going to have a good job. The same with procurement method. Um, this may not be the time to enter the design build market if you've never done it. I'm not saying you can't learn it, but uh, usually there's a learning curve with anything that's new. So trying something that you haven't done before. And then finally, contract language. Again, a bad contract can negate a lot of good work because the terms don't go your way. Now your feedback to me, and I know I can't really get it yet, but maybe Stan, but it, it, things are tough now. Um, I'm not going to be able to just get work that I've always done. I'm going to have to stretch a little bit. And we understand that a little bit, but kind of a good rule of thumb is the further you get away from each of these things, the more risky a job becomes. So let's say I'm going to try a new type of work, but it's in a familiar location with a bunch of people that I've worked with. It's a procurement method I'm familiar. I've got a good contract. I've done work for this owner before. Well, maybe that's a risk you might want to think about taking and realize you have to be a little careful about it. But now let's say you're doing a new type of work for someone you've never worked for with a bad contract. That's a recipe probably to lose money. Um, so you really have to think about it and have your people and your estimators, your project people kind of kind of keep it simple at some point in time. You can talk yourself into some, ah, I can hit that outside corner pitch down the line. I know I can slap it in the corner for a double. Maybe not. Um, and again, it, it is a percentage game. And the more often you take these risks, the more often we see contractors have trouble. So it sounds uh, like the, the downside of the risk could outweigh the benefit of- Yeah, I, I really do. What, what, what was really clear in the last uh, recession for us is, those contractors that tried to grow during the recession tended to do worse than those that were willing to get smaller and to stick to do what they were uh, doing well at. You just had to shrink your swing zone a little bit and be willing to be a little smaller for a while mm -hmm. um, from that. And then the next slide. So this, this kind of gets it a good way to think about it, okay? And this is a little uh, fancy there on the right, but it's really a pretty simple slide. So the blue line is the market price for, and we'll take it, it's for anything, but we'll take it for construction. There's not much you can do about the market price. It kind of is what it is when you bid, correct? Everyone kind of knows that's where the market is, okay? What you're trying to do though, is look at that green line. You want to find work where your risk price is below the market price, okay? And that may differ for different accounts, but where you're gonna make money is when you bid low and left here in this chart, okay? And as long as your risk-based price is below your market price, that's where you make money. But if you look over to the right there in the upper, white, uh, the upper outside contract, that's where your risk gets above the market price. And no matter what you do at that point, you're not gonna be able to make money, even if it's good work for you. If the work gets so cheap, the market price gets down so low that it can't justify the risk you're taking, you got to be disciplined enough to take a pass. So how do you do that? Um, man, it's really important now more than ever that you and your employees or your customers, uh, uh, can you go back one? Sure. Um, still, know your cost. And I can't say that enough. Um, really know your cost. And that will help. Um, the market, man, the market doesn't know how to price risk. It just prices what's out there. And the same job today that you were bidding uh, a year ago at a 12% margin, maybe a 7% margin today, nothing changed in the risk equation there. Nothing. The market price changed. And you have to figure out, is your risk price below the market price? If it is, you can continue to bid. If it's not, you shouldn't. And, and just remember that last principle and your employees should understand that. Don't fall in love with the job. There's no single job that any business 
has to have. Okay. It's still, there's still going to be work out there. So don't fall in love with a single job. Now, now you can go on Louisa. And that, that risk is, is really individual to each company, right? It's, it's, it's going to vary. Yes. Everyone's got their strengths and weaknesses and there's some that you're, you'll share more commonality with than others, but yeah, it's, it's, you have to assess that yourself as a business owner. Um, or if you're an insurance agent or broker, help your customer assess that. So how do companies know what, where these fat pitches are to use your analogy? Um, yeah, I, I kind of go back to being there and I kind of said this another thing, work where you've been successful if you can. Mm -hmm. And, and it's going to be really important now to do what you know how to do. Um, maybe you have to learn something a little bit. Uh, but if, if you're doing what you've done and doing what you know what you're doing for people you know with teams that have done it under fair and reasonable contract terms, I, I think that's the best recipe for success. I wish it was something mathematical or really, really good, but construction and most businesses really pretty simple is you got to do what you know. And, and yes, you may have to take a little more risk here and there, but, but try and do just one thing at a time. Try not to do three or four new things at a time. Um, it sounds like, but the companies may also be, need to be willing not to swing if they, if they don't see something and that, that might be a difficult. Um, yeah. I, I use two things. Sometimes the best job that you ever had is the one you didn't get. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of contractors, if you're listening, probably can nod your head with that. And, uh, an, another saying that one of my mentors taught me was in construction, you make money in shovels, in shovel fulls, uh, but you can lose it in dump truck loads. <laughs> and if you, uh, end up, uh, having one of those dump trucks on you, that's what we showed in that blue chart that can take you down. So what we're trying to do is avoid you from having that dump truck like event. Maybe you can lose a few shovels for a while. Uh, but that's a lot easier to bounce back from. And I, I think, uh, um, I think a good way to think about it is what, uh, uh, this next slide will say and a, a very successful businessman you'll recognize said it, but we'll, we'll close out with this slide here is he said, I don't look to jump over seven foot bars. I look around for one foot bars that I can step over. And I think that's a good way, a good thought to kind of for your team to lead right now is when you're in a tough time, don't take the hero shot, you know, uh, let's look for something we can do that's pretty easy. And, and yeah, you may have to look a little harder and work a little harder on that. And yeah, you might have to get a little smaller and you hate, hate doing that, but don't, don't confuse being busy with being successful. Um, you can be busy and lose a lot of money um, from that. This is, a, this is, you know, you're heading into a recession. Things are a little different um, and you have to prepare for it that way. Dave, is there anything you want to add? I, I would just second what Stan said about it's okay to get smaller, to reduce your own risk profile, your exposure to the enhanced risks that you see in the marketplace today doing work for owners that you've worked with before in places where you've worked with before with team members you've worked with before sounds overly simple but it's a key to success even in this marketplace where the world's getting a little bit smaller in front of you it's okay to get smaller stan was absolutely right we've seen contractors try to grow in a recession and they don't look very good coming out the other end if you want to look strong and good coming out the other end, I take a hard look at the advice called out here today. And I think, I mean, we've looked at, um, you know, the, the overhead was pretty lean going into COVID-19. So there might be some difficult decisions that, that these companies have to make. But I think, you know, Dave, you've made the point before that, um, you know, making those tough decisions today can, could help you be around in the future. Yep. Absolutely. So at this point, we, we'd love to open it up and, and take some questions. Uh, you can enter them in the, the Q&A field in your, your chat window, and we have a couple coming in right now. So um, this one, outside of the private sector, do you think we'll see any federal or state projects ramping up as a sort of stimulus to the economy? Uh, I'll, I'll take a first crack at that. So I'll start at the state and municipal level. Um, that, that's where this recession is very different. Um, 
the, the tax impact on the state and, and city budgets that you guys all live in and work in have never been hit like they were hit in the last two to three months. And this is a hole that they cannot fill back. So most state or fiscal budgets run seven ones. Um, so people are gonna feel that hole and they're gonna have to make some tough decisions going forward. And it's very hard, I think, for a city or a state to stimulate especially uh, depending on the economic condition they were in heading into this. But I think it's gonna to be tough to do that. And it's gonna to be tough for a city to say, heck, I'm gonna lay off 300 people in our certain departments or whatnot, or I can build this new uh, $60 million courthouse or something. I think you're gonna find the buildings start getting delayed. Um, I, I think it's gonna be hard for that to do that. So. Um, that has us uh, a little more worried uh, than anything in the past. Federally, I would love to say we have a very functional government that always looks out for the best people and doesn't care about partisan politics, uh, but that has not been our experience for the last 10 or so years, uh, and I don't expect that to change in the short run. I would love to say that there would be a stimulus coming forward before the election, um, I'm not so sure that our government will get their sack together and do that. Uh, but I do think we will see ultimately fiscal stimulus from the federal side. Um, I think you'll probably see it maybe more targeted than in the past. I think they're gonna have to help our hospitals and healthcare folks with the uh, financial uh, situations that they've been hit on. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, yes, they're gonna look at infrastructure as they've done in the past because that's easy, but, but I think this one's a little more broad based. So uh, um, I'm optimistic that something will come together there, but that may have a 18 to 24 month lag before it really gets to you. So I think you have to prepare for that. And would David, it be fair, fair, to, fair to assume that, uh, that contractors should stick to that fat pitches um, rule of thumb when, when looking at stimulus projects? Well, I hope I'm wrong with that. There is a lot of work that's out there because then things will keep going. But I, yeah. I, I just don't see how the, the budgets and in, in, in most city governments don't run with excess. No one had built in rainy day funds to cover this. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we're, we've got some some real deep holes to dig out of and I, the taxpayers can't take it all on either. So this is going to be a. I think some shared pain by everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and many state and local governments are uh, prevented from borrowing large sums of money under a stimulus program though, that the federal government seems to be able to do pretty, pretty easily if they have the will to do it. So to Stan's point, many of them are locked out from ever even being able to consider such a thing because they're structurally incapable of being able to borrow like that. Interesting. So as construction firms begin to recover after the Great Recession, what sectors did we see improvement in first? And are there any lessons we can take from that? The, the last one or, or this one? The, the Great Recession, uh, 2009, 2010. Oh, I thought you saw a, a pretty big um, residential component, mm -hmm. you know, both in uh, uh, f for sale condominium type and, and apartments. I mean, the residential side boomed. Um, mm -hmm. After that, uh, that's one that I, I can say really, really took off. That and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know. This side, uh, this time though, Louisa, I, I'm I'm thinking. You know, Dave kind of hit on a little bit. We think manufacturing probably is going to see a bit little uptick as they bring back supply chain to here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everyone realized just in time maybe wasn't as good as everyone thought it was. We had nothing in reserve. And it works fine as long as there isn't a, a big disruption, but we got that disruption. I think uh, technology data center, uh, think about virtual bandwidth and things like that. That'll be a growth area. Uh, healthcare, though the, the, the hospitals themselves are greatly impacted financially and not in a good way. We are gonna have to think about delivering healthcare differently and, and, and how we want people to enter hospitals and things of that nature. So I think you're gonna see investment there um, and, and probably those areas first. Um, 
you know, I still think residential will come back in, in some form because people need a place to live, but I'm not sure you'll see a hotel or an office building or anything like that as a high priority on any developer's bid list here in the short run. And we're just going to have to figure out what the world is going to look like till we get a vaccine. And, and I don't have answers as whether people are going to rush back to the city or we're going to become more suburban again. Does anyone want to get onto a train? And you were investing in, in light rail and transit, but it's going to be a while before I think people are comfortable getting on things like that. So opportunity to do some work if you believe there's going to be a vaccine. Uh, but that, those are great unknowns. Hmm. And, and what do you think that the turnaround timeline wise would be um, in, in seeing some of these projects with the um, you know, the onshoring and the manufacturing before these projects are, are ready to get started? Um, that's a great question. I, I wish I had a perfect crystal ball. I think companies that are financially did well during this situation will probably be able to do it uh, more quickly than others. I think uh, a thoughtful government program on key needs for our country probably can help stimulate that as well. Um, so that's a the, those are all very good questions, but I, I think it's real clear that there's certain things we need, medical equipment, um, mm -hmm. things like that, that need to be in reserve. I think warehouses will be a, a growth area. You know, the online sales and things like that uh, will probably have a lot more warehouses than uh, retail stores. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at some point, you hope our restaurants come back, but uh, um, things like that. Um, and you know, the retail developments that we were seeing, we hope will continue to go. Mm -hmm. um, student housing, Dave mentioned that. We thought that would be a great booming area, but right now that's a little shaky. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's just a lot of uncertainty that's out there. Yeah. We have a, a question from an underwriting perspective. How will you view enhanced balance sheets as a result of the PPP funds that companies may have received? Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> well, um, the need for liquidity at the time was was very important, and and our clients, many of whom many of whom did get it, uh, got it for all the right reasons. Um, the way we look at it has a lot to do with the way you know the, there's there's two options in the end: you either repay it or it gets forgiven, and the process by which the loan is analyzed for its use and is forgiven is there's some risk in that. And I think that's a moving target. So we have, uh, we have treated to, we have decided to treat it as if it is a long-term liability and we leave the liquidity up top. Unless I don't think we've had any of our clients stand up. We had any of our clients yet have had their loan adjudicated to say that it's forgiven yet. Um, well, not, not completely yet. Um, so yeah, I think our initial thought with it is consistently is, hey, it's dead until it's not. But it, if it does, if, if it is forgiven, it's going to be done fairly quickly in an interim cycle. Um, for most people, if they're a, a 12, 31 year end. Um, so most of the forgiveness will come here in these next few months. And then we'll see if they extend it further um, from that. And uh, but we think it was a really smart thing to do for those that uh, need that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, we certainly the last uh, recession was a liquidity crisis, right? Uh, the money capital markets froze up and the, for all the things you can say good or bad, the federal government did a good job of turning out the printing press and keeping liquidity in the marketplace. And that did not happen as quickly here. And I'll give credit to construction owners and general contractors and subs, everyone paid each other and was very good about that. Everyone was very concerned about that at the beginning. Cool. Um, and, and so we didn't see that official, uh, that initial credit freeze we saw at the last time. Hmm. But long, long run, um, you know, this is going to be a long term recession. And hopefully those that use that triple P funds kept some people off the unemployment rolls, um, built themselves some cushion. Um, and, and over time, we will uh, treat it, uh, we'll see if it's forgiven or not. If it is forgiven, it'll become an earnings. I think it'll become in the other income. It'll, it'll come in as earnings. And the debt will just disappear. 
Um, mm -hmm. So we're, we're kind of taking, I guess, a middle position on that, but one we think is pretty prudent. Great. It's a great question, though. We have a, a question about the your fat pitches baseball analogy. So if if you're supposed to swing at the fat pitches, what happens if the only pitches being thrown are low and outside? So if, if none of the projects really fit into that category that, you know, familiar and, and the owner that you know and some of the other um, metrics you're talking about? That's a great question. Uh, um, I, I think you have to think long and hard of that if you're a business owner, okay? is uh, it depends also on uh, your, how much have you built in your business and what do you want to do with that? Um, and during the last recession, there were some pretty successful contractors that decided there wasn't a pitch out there that they could swing at, that they wanted to swing at. And so they took their money and went home. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard decision. I'm not saying that's the right one for every business and some businesses can't do that. But uh, if you're constantly going to, you know, that 180 in construction, that's not going to be a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think you have to, to really be disciplined and, and have the courage to say no and say no and to get smaller. Um, and at some point, uh, uh, it may, may be the right decision to, you know, pay all your bills and take your hard earned money and net worth you've, you've earned during these two times and, what Dave likes to say, keep your powder dry for another day. Mm -hmm. uh, that that I, definitely worked better last time. Yeah, I agree with Stan. I, you know, it, it, um, ha having coached for a long time, I um, we used to tell uh, tell the girls, leave it down there, right? And so uh, after four of them, you walk to first base, right? If they're not giving you anything to hit, you have the choice to swing at something outside the strike zone or take it and live to see another day. Right. So that's pretty much what Stan's point was. Mm -hmm. You can you can take the pitches and don't have to swing at everything that's thrown up there. Versus being, being disciplined. disciplined. Again, yeah. it comes back to being disciplined. Very good. It's it's I, I'm not saying it's easy because I, people like to work. Yeah. People like to do things. And, and uh, but you also as a business owner or as a business advisor have to take into account is can you generate the type of return that you're looking to return? And is there a chance that I'm going to lose money? So uh, mm -hmm. I get a couple of jobs and, you know, I have built up, a, you know, a war chest of net worth of my company and I give 40% uh, back uh, in a year. Well, maybe I would have been better off not playing. Mm -hmm. so those are things you have to think about over time um, and, and make some hard decisions. Very good. Well, we have time for one more question and, and I think we can potentially this one gives us the chance to end on a positive note. What are the early indicators that a recovery is beginning to occur? Well, like, I'll, I'll take one of those. Uh, like from your graph we had before about the AIA building cycle, you'll start to see that come back up above, above 50. Unemployment mm -hmm. will, will drop. You'll start to hear about there's nobody sitting on the bench in the union halls mm -hmm. right? because they're being called out to work. Um, those are a couple of the easy ones that, that are very clear to see. Mm -hmm. And just a general overall level of activity. I mean, we see it by the virtue of the number of bid requests we get from contractors for bid bonds or um, uh, requests for RFPs and different instruments that we write around those. So as that volume starts to increase, that'll be a good bellwether of improved construction activity levels. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's a, uh, the, the shape of this recovery is still uncertain. Everyone hoped quickly it was going to be a V. It's clearly not going to be a V and where it bounces right back to where it was before. And this was just like a three month hole or something mm -hmm. that isn't happening. So will it be a U where it's a longer hole, but it gets back up there pretty quick. I think a lot of people are thinking probably not now. So now we're either looking at a W where it swings up a little bit back down and maybe back up or possibly even an L that eventually heads back up. But the L's kind of the worst is this is for an extended period of time, we're just gonna have a lower level of economic output and opportunity. And it's still a little bit too early to tell for that, but I, I think uh, um, how well our government functions and is able to stimulate its role is to provide stimulus in times like this 
um, and it has been able to do that in the past. And hopefully it'll be able to do that here again uh, in this cycle. But uh, certainly we need to see a little better uh, um, partisanship in, in Congress to help make some of that happen for all of us. I think it's really critical. That's great. Well, we're almost out of time here. Um, you know, we, we've had a great conversation and we appreciate Stan and Dave, all of your time today. Um, just a few housekeeping announcements. There's, there's plenty more that you can check out at travelers.com. You can also enter your email into um, the Zoom chat and contact your travelers rep for more information or to get information on this recording if you'd like to share it with others on your team. So. Um, Thank you all for your time. Uh, thank you for coming today and um, good luck to everyone in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.